Hey everybody, what's going on and welcome to GNR Central and uh, I just want to thank some of you guys who brought yesterday's video to my attention. So I released a video yesterday talking about why Guns N' Roses hated touring with Iron Maiden and there was some audio issue with the first interview that's in my True Story episode. So I went back and fixed it and I've re-uploaded it so if you guys missed it, you guys can go back to my videos and you'll see it's been re-uploaded and you can finally hear the audio. It was kind of weird. It, the audio was fine on iMovie, but then I guess when I uploaded it, something must have happened. But now it's working fine. So I want to thank you guys for bringing that to my attention. So let's get started with today's news. Now Slash gave an interview to Norwegian TV. I want to thank one of my subscribers for bringing this to my attention. So he gave an interview. He was in Norway playing a show with the conspirators. And it's about a four minute long interview, but he did talk about Guns N' Roses and what he's planning on doing once his tour with the Conspirators is over. Now his tour wraps up in August, and of course he talked a bit about Guns N' Roses. Here's what he had to say during the interview about it. Spørsmål er mange nok lurer på. Er likevel når Guns N' Roses skal gi ut ny plate? Vi spør om fremtidsplaner. Thanks a lot. Yeah, man. After this tour is over in the summertime in August, then obviously it's, as it's been commonly talked about lately uh there's you know the guns and roses thing and if we're gonna do that so there's definitely gonna be some focus on that for the forventningsfulla er det altså lov å håpe so Slash has been making the rounds doing interviews to promote his current tour and his latest album Living the Dream and he recently spoke to Kerrang magazine which is kind of funny considering they called out Kerrang and Get in the Ring but I think that was more of a beef that Axel had with uh, Mick Wall and not necessarily the entire magazine so in, during one of the interviews he gave to Kerrang he talked about his first rehearsals with Axel Rose and getting into the room with Axel for the first time to start writing and playing music and here's what he basically had to say. He said the first time we jammed together was at a rehearsal space in Hollywood and it was intense. We started working together at that point and we did some shows and it was very unpredictable and wild like okay let's just see what happens. It was pretty surreal back on this reunion tour because that was the first time Axel Duff and I were back in the same room in person. There was this unquestionable powerful chemistry that I had really hadn't thought about because it had been 20 years and I always knew we had this thing and just happened as soon as we played in and started playing and it was like an overwhelming feeling of oh yeah in the same interview he talked about the concert that guns and roses did or the show they did at the donnington festival at the monsters of rock uh, back in 1988 and how it was supposed to be such a joyous time for the band but it really didn't turn out that way because two fans were killed during guns and roses set so he was asked by the interviewer your first donnington experience in 1988 was both incredible and tragic when two fans died mid-show what do you remember of that? And he said, I really don't know Monsters of Rock, which was then called the Donington event back then. We got the gig and helicoptered out to sound check and didn't really, it didn't sound great at all. So I remember not being at all really into that. And then the next day we go up there and I didn't really have any expectations, but there was a lot of people. And the reaction the second we walked on stage was unbelievable. So we had this amazing 40 minute set or whatever it was. And it was really a huge high point for the band. Then afterwards we went to this bar drinking this little hotel we were at. I don't remember if we were sleeping there or why we were there, but there were tons of kids there and it was a scene in itself. I ran into our tour manager at the bar and he was crying. That's when I found out the two kids had been trampled to death when we were playing and there was a bizarre shift from complete euphoria to going to this depressed state. The positive memory of the gig got washed away and it was pretty heavy. He also revealed it took a pretty heavy toll on him. He said, yeah, how do you come back from that? How do you handle that? And what's your attitude going to be tomorrow and the next day after that, considering this just happened? Because it happened on our watch and it took a while to get over that. Turning now to some eyebrow raising news. Now, we all know that hipsters are have really brought vinyl back into the forefront of, of music. There's a lot of vinyl stores you can go get vinyl records from, but cassette tapes are apparently selling quite well as in addition to that. So it turns out Guns N' Roses' Appetite for Destruction still sells a decent amount of copies on cassette tapes. So according to Billboard magazine, thanks to acts such as Britney Spears, 21 Pilots, and Guns N' Roses, along with soundtracks from Guardians of the Galaxy franchise, which boasts the year's top two sellers, and Netflix Stranger Things series, cassette tape album sales in the U.S. grew by about 23% in 2018. According to Nielsen Music, cassette tape sales climbed from 178,000 in 2017 to 219,000 copies in 2018. 
Now, while that's a small number compared to the overall album market, which is about 140 albums sold in 2018, that's a sizable number for what was considered a once dead format. In fact, in 2014, cassette album sales numbered just 50,000, but 20 years before that, back in 1994, when cassettes were still very much a very hot selling format, there were 246 million cassette albums sold that year of an overall 615 million albums. Now, cassette album sales in 2018 are still a very niche offering with most significant titles limited to specifically reissues or unique projects. So among the top 10 selling cassette albums were 21 Pilots' new studio album Trench and the reissue of Britney Spears' debut album Baby One More Time. Now, Trench was issued on a yellow color cassette and sold about 7,000 copies in 2018, finishing at number three as the uh, big, number three best-selling record um, of the year. Now, Appetite for Destruction, however, is still selling pretty damn good. So Appetite for Destruction was the seventh best-selling um, cassette tape of last year. It sold about 3,000 copies. At the same number, Metallica's uh, Garage Days Revisited sold the same number of copies. It took the eighth spot. While Elvis Presley, which is, of course, a huge influence on Axel, sold about 2,000 copies of Where No One Stands Alone, while the Wu-Tang Clan took the number 10 spot at 2,000 copies sold. Now, number one was taken by Guardians of the Galaxy. They sold 24,000 cassette tapes last year. Uh, they also took the number two spot. So the first Guardians of the Galaxy was number one. The second movie's soundtrack was number two. Now, Slash gave another interview um, to a Polish outlet, and he talked a bit about how he doesn't like to be the, quote, rock star guy. He said, I don't like being the big rock star guy very well, and I don't like playing him either. I'm not that guy. I just say, forget it. I just want to play, and that's all I really focus on. I pretty much, that's where I pretty much am all the time playing. It's very much a passion thing for me, and all the other sort of stuff that comes with having arrived in any form of success is irrelevant. I just don't do the celebrity thing. People might want to try and see me in that kind of role, but it doesn't stick. He also said back, he talked a bit about file sharing as well in the interview. He said back in the late 90s, early millennium, when everybody was doing the file sharing thing, the internet basically killed the music industry. Now we've sort of come out of it with these streaming services, but they don't pay anywhere near the royalties that buying a CD or record pays. It's definitely hurt the music business in a big way. It's easier for customers, but it's definitely not doing any favors to the actual artists themselves. Now let's turn to some non-Guns and Roses news and, uh, if you guys saw the Academy Awards a couple weeks ago, then you would know that Queen had a pretty good night at the Oscars. In fact, the band opened up the show with a performance alongside Adam Lambert. Um, they played We Will Rock You and We Are the Champions. And of course, the Freddie Mercury biopic Bohemian Rhapsody walked away with four Oscars for Best Film Editing, Best Sound Editing, Best Sound Mixing, and Best Actor in a Leading Role category. Now, guitarist Brian May described his feelings about the Oscar wins and revealed what really happened at the special ceremony event of the Oscars. He wrote, Well, yes, you saw I went very quiet after the Oscars were over, signaling the end of the movie award season. So what really happened? We opened up the Academy Awards show in a way it's never opened before in an avalanche of excitement, looking out for an instant standing ovation from a glittering audience containing many of our heroes all beaming and singing with us and punching the air. We suddenly, we then shockingly walked away with four Oscars, the top hall of the night, and the head of the local production came up to me and shook my hand as we left the auditorium. He said, I've been doing the Oscars for 40 years, and that was the best opening we ever had. A lovely moment. So everyone assumes that we would just, uh, we would then all go forth deliriously partying with a not a care in the world, but I guess I'm not that kind of animal. I was, and I am deeply grateful for our Freddy film being recognized in a way we never had the audacity to expect, but I found the public activity behind the whole award season and the behavior of the media writers surrounding it deeply disturbing. If you look at the press and the internet discussions of what took place over the last several months, you can see that 90% of it's aimed at discrediting one or another, and all of, it, all of the nominated films by innuendo and smears rather than discussing the merits and admiring the skills that went into making them. Vitriol and dishonesty and blatant attempts to shame and influence the members into voting that way in the way they did, and their arrogance required them to. It's not the fault of the award panels, they stood up well. It's a kind of vindictive sickness that seems to have gripped public life. All, all through it though, I've been biting my tongue, not wishing to influence the results of the ballots even by a hair. But when the curtain came down, I was left with very mixed feelings. They persisted until I read this very well thought out and well written article in, in The Spectator. Brave, truthful, and I don't have to explain it all. It's here. So let me know what your guys' thoughts are on Bohemian Rhapsody walking away with those four awards, and most importantly, the Best Actor Award. 
I personally liked the film a lot. I was kind of surprised it got nominated for so many Academy Awards considering the critics had mixed feelings about the film. So that does it for today's news video, guys. Thanks for watching. We're going to have a great True Story episode for you guys tomorrow. Um, I know some people have asked a lot to do something about Michael Jackson. And with um, the Neverland documentary being out, I thought maybe it's a good time to talk about the relationship between Slash and Michael Jackson and Axel as well. So we're going to be talking about that tomorrow. I hope you guys can check it out and enjoy it. Thanks for watching, guys. Hit the like button and be sure to subscribe if you love GNR as much as I do. And go check out my blog, GNRcentral.com, for the latest news about the band. Take care. Hey, this is Dizzy Reed from Guns N' Roses, and you're watching GNR Central. Yeah!